This story out of Colorado is upsetting, and heads up, this footage is hard to watch. Welcome to CSL TV, and I just hope you guys are having a beautiful, blessed day. Now, if you're new to the channel, this is just a review, a reaction, as well as an informational channel. Hopefully, the informational part will be on someone now, and we're just going to watch some videos and talk about it. And if you've been rocking with your boy, I just got to say, hey, thank you so much for watching these videos, because, you know what I'm saying, I don't want to be watching them by myself. But I know I ain't been active how I usually been because I'm trying to prepare myself for this back surgery and I'm not even you know I'm saying all the way prepared for it mentally like I'm like 90% mentally there but you know that's another time another subject another topic all that stuff um but anyway I kind of got off you know I might like have a long intro so I kind of got off a little bit to let y'all know why I ain't been posting how I usually post and this is because I'm trying to prepare myself for this procedure. Now, I don't know, you know, physical therapy or anything yet, but I'm going to shut my mouth so we can watch this video. So let's get it. This is the tragic and bloody story of how wanton abuse and neglect twisted the lives of two innocent children, turning little Catherine and Curtis into 12 year old killers. Catherine Jones was born in 1985, and her brother Curtis Jones was born a year later in 1986. Their parents, Curtis Jones Sr. and Stacy Parks, had a marriage that was far from ideal. Stacy had suffered severe abuse from her husband Curtis long before the pair got married. One particularly awful case of abuse tore Stacy's uterus, leading to the premature birth of Catherine. At a point, Stacy couldn't stand the abuse anymore, packed up her things, and left the home. Catherine and Curtis were four and three years old at the time. According to Stacy, she didn't take her kids with her for fear that her mother would reject them because they were biracial. They were left in the far from capable hands of Curtis Sr., a decision that would have very tragic consequences. By 1994, five years after Stacy's departure, some of Curtis's male relatives had begun living with him and his kids. One of these relatives had a very concerning criminal history. He was a registered pedophile. This man had been convicted of sexual crimes against his girlfriend's daughter, a 14-year-old girl. Curtis Jr. would eventually reveal to his mother, who lived in a different state at the time, the abuse he was facing at the hands of this particular relative. It was also later revealed that Catherine was also suffering the same thing as well. This news, of course, alarmed the mother. So you mean to tell me these kids was living in a household with a pedophile and the father knew exactly who this mother, this guy was. So why would he not, not try to protect his kids from something like that. You know what I'm saying? So I hope that, man, those kids, because the title of this said that they was sent to prison when realistically they shouldn't have been sent to prison. The one involved should have been sent to prison, but I'm gonna shut up and we gonna watch and see how this play out. And the authorities were involved. An investigation was started, but closed after young Curtis changed his story, lying to the authorities likely under threat from someone in his family. Curtis and Catherine continued to suffer physical and sexual abuse. Things got so bad that at the age of 13, Catherine tried to run away from home. This prompted her teacher to notify the authorities, and once again, an investigation was opened. Investigators even discovered signs of sexual abuse, but just like with Curtis, Catherine was bullied into lying to the officials by her father, who chose to take the side of the relative instead. This was the breaking point for the young children. Catherine and Curtis began to plot a way to free themselves from their torment, and to them, that meant killing their abuser and everyone that didn't help, including their father and their father's girlfriend, 29-year-old Nicole Spites, who was living with them. Figuring that they had to do it one person at a time to stand any chance of success, they waited for the right moment. On the 6th of January, 1999, they set their plan into motion when Nicole was alone at home with the children. The children retrieved their father's 9mm semi-automatic pistol and did what they thought had to be done. Catherine took the first shot, hitting Nicole in the stomach, but dropped the gun in the process. Curtis picked up the weapon and fired nine bullets, four of which fatally injured Nicole. In a state of panic, they tried to clean up the bloodstains and hide the body. Then, they tried to make it look like a robbery by messing up the house. After that, they ran over to their neighbor's house, told them that they had shot the gun by accident 
and then ran off to hide in the woods nearby. The police showed up to investigate and the children were taken into custody the next morning. At the ages of 12 and 13, Curtis and Catherine were the youngest people to be charged as adults. Considering how young they were, the prosecutors decided to strike a deal with them. They would be tried for second-degree murder and be sentenced to 18 years in prison and life on probation. This deal meant they wouldn't have a proper trial, no witnesses, and no evidence. But at least they wouldn't serve life in prison. The inexperienced and no doubt terrified children agreed to the deal. They were found guilty and they were locked up. The children never spoke out about the abuse they experienced as they had been refused help so many times in the past. The media claimed that they killed their father's girlfriend out of a jealous desire to monopolize their father's love. The truth of their abuse would eventually surface five years later when Catherine agreed to an interview. Catherine also spoke about regretting killing Nicole. This sadly did not affect her prison sentence. The siblings would serve most of their sentence and would be released at 30 and 29 years old. Now, the pair fight to ensure Sure, fair sentencing for young people. Now, I know they did their prison time um, for murdering that lady, and they should have had did the footsteps of these kids who was all in the household. They should have seen that somebody who was a pedophile was in the household, what they'd done previously, and then what was being said now. Like, come on, these kids shouldn't even been in the system. And then, you know, they have to go ahead and do the time. They out now. So they lifetime probation should definitely be taken off. And I'm glad to hear that she's out here helping kids and girls go through, you know, something what she had already experienced to hopefully get them to speak up about what they could possibly be going through. This story out of Colorado is upsetting, and heads up, this footage is hard to watch. It all went down in this neighborhood about a half hour east of Denver. At around 10.30 at night, a car full of teens is parked in front of a house so the driver could go inside and grab some cash. That's when a guy in a truck rolls up behind their car and parks. I have a camera. I'm calling the cops. It's hard to make out what's said, but the guy in the truck is confronting the teens because he had seen their car driving around recklessly. Then you could have asked me, I could have been a creep, I was coming up to my house like that. Okay, well, so if you're a neighborhood, An argument starts to escalate between the teens and the guy in the truck when things take a shocking turn. Again, this is upsetting. The guy gets out of his truck and pulls out a handgun and a 17-year-old is armed with a ghost gun. The 17-year-old shoots the guy in the hip, and the guy returns fire five times. The group of teens cry out as their friend lies on the ground, and the guy from the truck yells out from behind. Kidding me! I'm chill, dude! He just came at me and shot at me, dude! He just came at me and shot at me, dude! Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? The guy then goes to park his truck. I'm coming back. I'm just going to park my car right here. Okay. And as the police are called, the guy runs back and tries to perform CPR on the 17-year-old. Hey, hey, hey. He's dead. He's on the ground. No, he's still breathing. He's going. He's going. He's going. But the 17-year-old ended up dying in the hospital. It turns out the guy who shot the teen had been a former cop who had just quit the police force a few weeks earlier. Cops asked if he was using drugs or alcohol, and the guy said no, but lab results revealed that he was legally drunk with a blood alcohol level over twice the legal limit. Police claimed the ex-cop's drunken state contributed to his behavior. This all went down back in 2021 on the day before Thanksgiving, a holiday the teen's dad says will never feel the same. I don't know if there'll ever be a Thanksgiving again. Um, I know during Christmas, we're planning on just having a dinner and we'll leave Peyton's chair empty. Um, but the time of that this has happened has completely ruined our holidays. It's not yet clear how or why the 17-year-old got his hands on a ghost gun, an unregistered, privately assembled weapon that lacks a serial number, making it untraceable. The teen's dad claims, had he known about the weapon, he would have taken it away. The ex-cop, who was 36 at the time of the shooting, faces multiple charges including second-degree murder, and in August, the teen's father filed a wrongful death lawsuit over his son's death. Well, 
that's kind of messed up. Um, this is something old that happened, but I want to review to talk about why, you know, he was drunk driving. Now think about people that got into a car accident. He could have seriously hurt somebody. And I'm kind of dealing with a situation right now of car accidents and cars. And that texting, anything that distracts you while you're driving, oh my God, please do not do it. Because, man, if something bad happened, tragic, the person that's going through it mentally is just, you have to be strong to deal with it. But the police officer knew what was right. He knew what was wrong. Or I should say former police officer. So hopefully he get charged the way he should be charged for being a drunk driver.